Okay. There, we're official. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. You're welcome. Um, so our first speaker is Lindsay Carmen Williams. She is a PhD candidate in literary studies at Washington State University. Her research interests include the long 19th century American and British literature, the Gothic, gender theory, and feminist critical disability studies. She has published an article and book reviews in 19th century gender studies, the Journal of the Fantastic in the Arts and Gothic Studies. Her dissertation investigates the conflict between spiritualism, science, and the female spiritualists in the 19th century and 20th century American and British women writers, ghost stories, and occult tales. Lindsay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming and attending. Um, I'm going to share my screen and uh, share a PowerPoint with you all while I read my paper. OK, I think you need to be made co-host to do that. So there it is. Yes, great. Yeah. Can you all see this? All right, thank yes, you. Yes, we can. we can. All right, it's going to present mode. Let's see if this will work. OK, can everyone see my screen all right? Yes. Well, all right, thank you. Yes. Um, if I lag, I don't have the best internet connection. So if I lag, just um, let me know um, and I will hopefully my internet works. Um, again, welcome everyone um, to my presentation. My title is um, Examining the Female Vampire as Female Gothic Tradition in Late Victorian British Gothic Fiction. Most often a female vampire in late Victorian British fiction is depicted as an enticing figure who lures her victims with overt sexual prowess. Um, there we go. Her uncurbed appetite also simultaneously tempts and horrifies male characters. Arthur, Hol Arthur Holmwood is repulsed by Lucy Westenra's open sexuality and Bram Stoker's Dracula, while Laura's father and Darren Wardenberg are appalled by Carmilla and Sheridan Le Fanu's novella. On a deeper level of analysis, the female vampire functions much more than just a deviant figure. She also unsettles the authority of patriarchal power and disrupts the performance of normative femininity through her actions and speech. In this conference paper, I argue that the female vampire, due to her opposition to patriarchy, heteronormativity, and normative femininity, should be considered part of the female Gothic tradition. Traditionally, this genre encompasses Gothic themes and works written by women authors that depict female anxieties and desires such as sexual repression, domestic confinement, and gender trauma. This paper examines how the female vampire's behavior represents female Gothic concerns and themes. For example, I illustrate how Harriet Brandt and Florence Marriott's The Blood of the Vampire and Lucy and Stoker's Dracula portray the, the fear of motherhood, while Carmilla and Leif Fanu's novella and Lady Duquesne and Mary E. Braddon's Good Lady Duquesne convey women's disenfranchisement within dominant society due to the, fe the fear of femaleness and female transgressive desires. Overall, this paper examines to portray how the female vampire in late Victorian British Gothic fiction should be considered part of the female Gothic tradition, despite the gender of the author, since this figure expresses overt female anxieties and fears. According to Diana Wallace in Uncanny Stories, the female Gothic is considered, quote, the mode within which women writers have had have been able to explore deep-rooted female fears about women's powerlessness and imprisonment within patriarchy, end quote. Since its inception, the female Gothic tradition has grown into a field that investigates anxiety specifically related to female identifying persons. The tradition was established in the late 1970s when Ellen Moores coined the term in her book, Literary Women. This literary field coincided with the rise of second wave feminism and literary criticism in the US and Britain, which focused on, quote, uncovering the lost tradition of women's literature, end quote, which Lauren Fitzgerald notes in the female Gothic and in the institutionalization of Gothic studies. Critics like Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubar were interested in creating a women authored canon since historically most Western literary canons have focused on men's works. Elaine Schulwalter declares that, quote, the theorization of the female Gothic as a genre expressed women's dark protest fantasies and fear. The field at first focused on women's fear of patriarchy and childbirth in Gothic texts like Anne Radcliffe's The Mysteries of Udolpho, which there's an image on this slide. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, and Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. 
scholars sought to understand the anxieties of female authorship that concerned that occurred during the late 18th and 19th centuries in Britain and the US in this field. Second wave feminists and theorists of the female Gothic like Moores, Gilbert, and Gubar identified similar tropes that appeared in early female Gothic works. These tropes include the persecuted heroine, the haunted house or mansion, a menacing male villain, and a male love interest who typically rescues the heroine. These archetypes can be found in any Radcliffean novel. However, as feminist and gender theory has developed within the past few decades, Scholars like Ellen Ledoux have challenged the negative portrayal of women as passive victims in early female Gothic works. Anne Williams and Art of Darkness use the female Gothic as subversive in its portrayal of women's resistance against patriarchal power and oppression. Whereas Diane Long Haveller in Gothic Feminism views the female Gothic as promoting victim feminism. Haveller defines victim feminism as quote, an ideology of female power through pretended and staged weakness, end quote. In other words, heroines in early female Gothic novels who attempt to escape evil male oppressors only challenge individual patriarchal authority, but remain complicit within the system itself. Female Gothic scholars during the 1990s and the early 2000s began to find this problematic as female protagonists failed to critique the institution of patriarchy in women's late 18th century Gothic novels. Unlike the persecuted heroine who appears in early female Gothic texts, I argue that the female vampire embraces transgressive behavior to destabilize the notions of identity and gender. So as um, time progressed and works were um, created by um, authors in the 19th and 20th centuries, this new figure emerges with just the female vampire. The female vampire, unlike her male counterpart in similar late Victorian Gothic fiction, evokes the cultural fear of female sexuality and uncontrollable desire. This figure also poses as a threat to patriarchy by undermining male supremacy and control. One of the most interesting aspects of the female vampire is her use of the body. In the female Gothic body, Marie Moldy Roberts notes that historically, quote, women have been identified primarily through the body, which throughout history has been associated with monstrosity. This representation persists within the Gothic in various forms, from the Gorgon to the vampire, end quote. On one hand, the depiction of the female vampire as a monstrous body illustrates the fear of femininity in women in general. Mulvey Roberts further argues that, quote, since the earliest days of humanity, negative stereotypes of women have been culturally absorbed, evolving into a widespread cultural misogyny in most societies. These have been reflected within Gothic lit literature, which has sometimes critiqued or even reinforced this distorted view of the feminine through representations of female monstrosity, feminine evil, or enhanced passivity. However, on the other hand, the female vampire's monstrous body has the potential to portray the double bind that women endure in Western culture. As Mulvey Roberts writes, quote, the female Gothic body has developed through the Madonna horde duality, incarceration, fragmentation, hybridity, and sexuality, while femininity itself has been demonized in Gothic literature by the way of the femme fatale, man-made monster, vampire, and Medusa, end quote. In other words, the female vampire represents women as familiar and other, as an object of sexual desire and surplus of sexual desire. I'm interested in exploring the female vampire in late Victorian British fiction as a figure that destabilizes the notions of gender performance and identity. Gina Whisker in Female Vampirism contends that, quote, disruptive and troublesome female vampires are an embodied oxymoron, a thrilling contradiction, fundamentally problematizing received notions of women's passivity, nurturing, and social conformity. Female vampires destabilize such comfortable culturally inflected investments and complacencies and reveal them as aspects of constructed gender identity resulting from social and cultural hierarchies, end quote. The female vampire state of in-betweenness allows her to challenge and subvert notions of ideal Victorian femininity. Traditionally, authors of the female Gothic tradition um, typically explored female-related fears such as domestic abuse, confinement to the domestic sphere, and the portrayal of domestic roles like wife and mother. The following section in this paper provides examples from Stoker's Dracula, Marriott's The, the Blood of the Vampire, Braddon's Good Lady Duquesne, and Le Fanu's Carmilla, 
to illustrate how these late 19th century British texts depict female Gothic concerns such as anxiety of motherhood and female transgressive desires. Um, overall, each depiction of the female vampire highlights dominant society's horror of femaleness and its urge to destroy the female vampire. Stoker's Dracula and Marriott's The Blood of the Vampire not only depicts the anxiety of motherhood, but also disrupts the essentialist assumption that all women fulfill or should fulfill the role of mother. In these vampiric texts, Lucy and Harriet depict the anti-mother, a female figure who harms children rather than serves as a nurturing protective mother. The anti-mother, of course, juxtaposes the widely accepted and supported Victorian notion of the angel in the house, an ideal that women are nurturing caretakers in the domestic sphere. At the beginning of Dracula, Lucy with Stenner's actions and behavior resembles the new woman, a real life female figure who expressed sexual desire and autonomy. She contrasts with Mina Harker, a female character who represents traditional Victorian feminine behavior in Stoker's novel. At the beginning of Dracula, Lucy expresses her anxiety of fulfilling the traditional role of wife. While distraught from declining multiple proposals, she rhetorically asks Mina, quote, why can't they let a girl marry three men or as many as want her and save all the trouble? But this is heresy and I must not say it, end quote. Lucy's diction demonstrates her anxiety of choosing not only one man, to, of choosing only one man to be with the rest of her life. Lucy's transgressive behavior is heightened after she transforms into a vampire. Not only does she portray the anxiety of marriage, but also motherhood. In a newspaper clipping from the Westminster Gazette, Vampire Lucy is referred to as the blue for lady. She allegedly leaves, quote, the same tiny wound, wound in the throat, end quote, on many children after draining their blood. Lucy's vampiric behavior transforms her into a figure um, of the anti-mother. Instead of protecting and providing care for children, Lucy instead causes them to be, quote, quite emaciated, end quote. As a transgressive creature, vampire Lucy expresses her anxiety of motherhood through the act of feeding on children. Lucy is destroyed by men of science, such as Professor Van Helsing and Dr. Seward, since she is considered a harmful figure in society. With the phallic symbol of the stake, vampire Lucy is stabbed to death in order to inhibit her from continuing to embody the anti-mother. Harriet Brandt in Marriott's The Blood of the Vampire portrays the role of the anti-mother as well. Interestingly, Marriott's novel was published the same year as Dracula, but this text has received little attention in scholarship. Harriet is a different type of female vampire from Lucy, Carmilla, and even Lady Duquesne. She's a mixed race psychic vampire that absorbs energy from those around her. Harriet first portrays her energy sucking behavior after arriving um, in Belgium. Her first victim is the infant of her friend, Margaret Poland. While being held and cared for by Harriet, the baby, quote, had its big eyes fixed upon Miss Brandt's face with a half odd, half interested expression, end quote. The baby's energy is slowly siphoned away by Harriet, who's unaware of her psychic vampiric abilities. Eventually, the baby dies, making Margaret distraught. And like Lucy, Harriet embodies the anti mother. Instead of nurturing the baby, Harriet feeds off of its energy. The anxiety of motherhood runs deep in Marriott's novel. Later in the text, Harriet discovers that her grandmother was bitten by a vampiric bat and passed on the vampire gene to her female descendants. Dr. Phillips, an acquaintance of, of Harriet's father, contends that Harriet, quote, possesses the fatal attributes of the vampire that affected her mother's birth, that endued her with a thirst for blood, which characterized her life. That will make Harriet draw upon the health and strength of all whom she may intimately be associated with, end quote. Not only does Harriet's vampiricism depict fear of the maternal, but also fear of racial otherness. Doubly marginalized in Victorian society, Harriet is seen as a monstrous other who is cast out and eventually commits suicide. Apart from the anxiety of motherhood, another female Gothic theme appears in Braddon's Good Lady Duquesne and Le Fanu's Carmilla, female transgressive desires. This theme is explored through the figure of the female vampire and her surplus of femaleness and overt desire. Lady Adeline Duquesne in Braddon's vampiric story illustrates society's anxiety of female transgression. Um, in the horror tale, Bella Rolston, a young poor woman accepts the job as the companion of Lady Duquesne who lives in Italy. While working for the rich woman, Bella becomes mysteriously ill. Unbeknownst to her, Bella undergoes blood transfusions at night, which are administered by a doctor. 
Lady Duquesne receives the blood transfusions to obtain immortality. Um, she's a single um, older woman who is um, marginalized in society. Lady Duquesne is described as having, quote, parchment complexion, and rumors circulate that she's at least 100, and, quote, her reminiscence go all the way back to the Regency period, end quote. Lady Duquesne's desire for immortality reveals her transgressive desires of living a non-traditional life. After Bella learns the truth about the blood transfusions, Lady Duquesne releases her from her duties and gives her money. And in a note that reads, goodbye child, go and marry your doctor, end quote. Lady Duquesne, a single woman who attempts to defy death, contrasts with Bella who was rewarded for her normative feminine behavior by marrying a handsome man. Carmilla in Le Fanu's novella exemplifies the female transgressive desire of queer sexuality. At the beginning of the story, Carmilla feeds on Laura at an early age. Laura, a young solitary girl who lives with only her father in Syria, recounts seeing, quote, a female figure standing at the foot of the bed, a little at the right side. It was in a dark, loose dress and it, its hair was down and covered its shoulders, end quote. Carmilla's loose hair and dress illustrates the looseness of her sexuality in this, in this tale. Years later, Laura befriends Carmilla, who was found quite ill in a carriage near her castle. Carmilla and Laura soon have an intense attraction toward one another. Um, Carmilla's relationship with Laura is quite sensual and sexual. She confesses um, that she loves Laura and quote, quickly hid her face in Laura's neck and hair with tumultuous sighs, end quote. Carmilla's transgressive sexual ardor for Laura is both through bloodlust and sexuality. Leif illustrates how female transgressive desires are ultimately punished in Victorian society. And Carmilla's punishment is none other than by a doctor. After Laura and her father discover that, Car that Carmilla is in fact a vampire named Mercala of the Karnstein family, a group of men, including the doctor, kill her. Carmilla, similar to Lucy, is stabbed and killed with a phallic symbol of the stake while sleeping in her coffin. Carmilla's sexual desires, although momentarily satisfied, are punished by the end of the tale. This ending highlights the anxiety of female queer desire within the system of patriarchy and heteronormativity. Investigating the female vampire through a female Gothic lens and vampiric tales written by Stoker, Marriott, Braddon, and Leigh Fanu reveals how this figure attempts to destabilize the notions of gender performance and identity, as well as depict the horrors of patriarchy. Not only does this figure represent the anxiety of motherhood, but also female transgressive desires. Vampires are meant to disrupt the nor normative assumptions of identity. As Whisker highlights, quote, vampires, creatures of myth and cultural metamorphosis, a metaphor for disruption, enable critique of what is feared and desired at different times, women's sexuality, foreign invasion, cultural difference, homosexuality, fear of bloodborne disease, and AIDS, end quote. By the end of these vampiric tales, each female vampire is punished for transgressing some norm, which highlights women's constant subjugation in patriarchal society. Lucy is literally staked for feeding on children. Harriet commits suicide after absorbing all of her husband's energy. Lady Duquesne is eventually unable to sustain her immortal life, while Carmilla is also staked for feeding on Laura. Female vampires, according to Whisker, are essentially unclean and the right to punish their behavior is premised on versions of normativity, conventional modesty, purity, compliance, and subordination. In early female vampire narratives, punishment go comes from the forces of order, the right of men to define them as sick, hysterical, wrong, to be managed, constrained, locked up, and destroyed, end quote. Focusing on how the female vampire contests patriarchal authority and power through a female Gothic lens reveals how this figure expresses women's frustration with, rebellion against, and ultimately their demise within the system of patriarchy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Uh, we'll save questions to the end. Our next speaker is Alejandra uh, Marquez. She's a first year PhD student at the University of California, Riverside. Her research lies in post-colonial studies, feminist theory and queer theory in relation to marginalized voices and experiences. Alejandra. Hi, thank you for that. Um, okay, so can everybody see the screen? Yes. Cool, awesome. 
All right, so my project is called Mexican Gothic, a contemporary look at the supernatural, the dark, and the deeply rooted issues of colonialism and gender in gender roles in Mexican culture. So this project looks at the portrayal and interpretation of Gothic literature genre in Silvia Moreno's Goth Mexican Gothic to see the ways in which she embodies traditional Gothic literature tropes of the dark, moody, and supernatural, but also touches on the very real and dark forces of colonialism and sexism in Latin America, and more specifically in, uh, in Mexico. So before jumping into the analysis of the text, uh, I do want to define what versions of the genre definition of Gothic literature I'm going to be using. The first is a traditional sense of Gothic literature, which is defined in the Bradford Glossary of Critical and Literary Terms as, uh, quote, a genre characterized by general mood of decay, uh, suspense and terror, action that is dramatic and generally violent or otherwise disturbing, loves that are destructively passionate, and landscapes that are grandiose, uh, if gloomy or bleak, end quote. Uh, examples of this are Frankenstein, Wuthering Heights, The Yellow Wallpaper, all very popular within, within the genre. Uh, a more contemporary approach to what is gothic literature genre is a uh, one that scholars such as Andrew Smith call a new wave of Gothic literature aptly uh, labeled as post-colonial Gothic literature, uh, which is a modern or post-modern way to view the current Gothic literature in media. Uh, Smith states that this, uh, that this shift to a post-colonial Gothic approach quote, relates to current issues, uh, current interest in post-colonial ideas, which have helped to widen the geographical understanding of what is meant by Gothic, end quote. Uh, and he often references Glennis Braun uh, when identifying a new global Gothic uh, model, which is, quote, the understanding of which enables a consideration of how Gothic has been absorbed, challenged, and locally developed outside of the Anglo-American tradition, end quote. Uh, so when we kind of move into the way that Gothic tropes are presented in Silvia Moreno's Mexican Gothic, we are given a very straightforward type of way that the traditional Gothic tropes present themselves. We have the moody uh, sort of setting, the creepy house, the very um, ominous people that live in the house, plus all these issues in the supernatural that come up. When describing the house, the main character Noemi states the following. Quote, Noemi stepped inside the house, uh, stepped inside the bedroom and regarded the ancient four poster bed, which looked like something out of a Gothic tale, even had curtains you could close around it, cocooning yourself from the world. Moreno, end quote. Moreno Garcia situates Noemi as a capable upper class and educated woman in 1950s Mexico, who is well versed in the fine arts, giving her the credibility to continuously make the uncanny connections between her reality at high place and the often supernatural settings in the gothic tales she references. These are just a few ways that Moreno Garcia incorporates traditional Gothic tropes into the novel, uh, but it's only upon closer examination and through what Smith proposes as a post-colonial Gothic analysis that we see the novel provides a deeper understanding of colonial influence and its residual hauntings in Latin America and more specifically in Mexico. So looking at the undertone of colonial presence and tensions in the text, uh, when we rework the traditional notion of Gothic literature genre and apply the post-colonial theoretical framework to the contextualization of the genre and by extension to the novel, we are met with a deeper understanding of the deeply rooted trauma of the colonial influence in Latin America. Moreno Garcia situates the main character Noemi, a Mexican socialite, as the heroine of the story sent to redo recon and if need be extract her cousin from high place, home of the Doyles, who are generational English settlers and miners, uh, and rather opts to, uh, rather opts out for of the troubled love story between a moody hero, hero and the devoted heroine for, uh, and pulls the readers in to see how Noemi must, in essence, fight the deeply rooted colonial ideologies that remain preserved in, within Mexico and are embodied by the Doyles and their house in order to free herself and those she cares for. We see this in the disturbing and reoccurring conversations revolving around race, aesthetics, and eugenics among the residents of High Place. It is also important to note the role that the supernatural plays in bringing to life these colonial tensions, as well as gender issues, which I go into later on. 
The, quote that, the quotes that follow uh, are examples in, of these colonial tensions and influences that are constantly seen through the novel. Uh, this quote is the one that's on the screen is from the first conversation between Noemi and uh, Howard Doyle and goes as followed. You are much dark, you are much darker than your cousin, Miss Tawada, Howard said after he had completely had after he had completed his examination of her. Pardon me, she asked, thinking she'd heard him wrong. He pointed at her, both your coloration and your hair. They are much darker than Catalina's. I imagine they reflect your Indian heritage rather than the French. You do have some Indian in you, no? Like most of the mestizos here do. Catalina's mother was from France. My father is from Veracruz and my mother from Oaxaca. We are Mastec on her side. What is your point? She asked flatly. Merely an observation. Now tell me, Mr. Boada, do you believe, as Mr. Vasconcelos does, that it is the obligation, no, the destiny of the people of Mexico to forge a new race that encompasses all races, a cosmic race, a bronze race, this despite the research of Davenport and Sergata, end quote. It is important to note that the majority of these conversations revolving around eugenics and, and race primarily include the horrendous Doyle patriarch, Howard Doyle, a man so old he smells of death and decay. Howard is obsessed with the topic of eugenics and race purity, all in the effort to preserve the bloodlines. However, it is only when we learn why he is so insistent in preserving the bloodline that the true horror sets in from the realization of the extent of which the Doyles have gone to protect what can otherwise be described as their colonial superiority. Noemi's constant back and forth in response to Howard's insistence on race superiority and his obsession with aesthetics is a subtle response uh, packed with notions of larger commentary about the constant need for Mexicans and Latin Americans to constantly prove their worth to European and North American white folk. This conversation takes place earlier in the book and sets the tone for the rest of the novel, informing the reader that one of the dark forces that the heroine will need to battle is passive racism sustained by the Doyles and High Place. While Moreno Garcia employs the traits of Smith, uh, of what Smith calls post-colonial Gothic literature, she further complicates a, the new genre by adding to it a feminist lens and complicating the character growth of Noemi in relation to her position as heroine and her identity as a Mexican woman. So gender in Mexican Gothic. By situating the colonial tensions early in the novel, Moreno Garcia introduces one of the main limitations working against Noemi's mission to rescue her cousin, Catalina, who after marrying Virgil Doyle, son of Howard Doyle, becomes distressed and calls for her cousin to help her escape from the house. Up until this point, the reader is aware of how High Place, along with the Doyles, preserve co colonial ideologies and white superiority. Yet in this mission to rescue her cousin, uh, Noemi comes face to face with another evil force, sexism. The issue of sexism is one that can be tied to colonial ideology, but can also be tied to traditional gender roles in Mexican culture. Moreno Garcia uses both ideologies to challenge the traditional melodramatic characteristics of the female characters in Gothic literature. The novel uh, pro progresses, uh, as the novel progresses, we see how the tensions brought on by gender issues are portrayed by the actual women in the story, but also by the supernatural. I'll start by looking at Catalina. Uh, in, the, in the following quotes, uh, we see how Catalina's ailments and her intuition of being in danger are dismissed as an episode of hysteria and melodrama, yet she is one of the first characters to warn Noemi of the dangers looming in high place that go beyond the physical and into the supernatural. Dr. Cummings, the Doyle family doctor, states to Noemi, your cousin, quote, your cousin is, very anxious, is a very anxious girl, quite melancholic, and the illness has intensified this, end quote which Noemi makes a distinction, quote, but melodramatic and anxious were not the same thing at all. And Catalina had definitely never heard voices in Mexico City. And she hadn't had that bizarre expression on her face, end quote. Here, Moreno Garcia employs a traditional melodramatic trope of the hysterical woman and the sexist medical diagnosis practices that would often be seen in Gothic, tale, in Gothic tales. Ms. Taboada, Noemi's mother, follows a more traditional role of, of the Mexican homemaker along with the female role set forth by the colonial ideology of marrying a suitable man and creating a home and more importantly, having and raising children. 
we see the way Ms. Taboada and Noemi are at ideological odds of what a goal of what the goals of a woman should be and how a man and how the man of the house dictates what a woman can and cannot do. Ms. Taboada is also one of the female characters to reinforce the acceptance for such a role and wanting her own daughter to follow the same cycle she did, which is acceptable according to gender, gender expectations, rather than allowing her to diverge and continue her education. Florence Doyle, like Ms. Taboada, also, uh, Mrs. Taboada, also reinforces the acceptance of traditional gender roles and further stresses the racial superiority of white folk. She states, quote, it is important to maintain a sense of order in one's house, uh, in one's life. It helps you determine your place in the world, where you belong. Taxonomical classifications help place each creature atop its right branch. It is no good to forget yourself nor your obligations, end quote. Noemi, however, is constantly at odds uh, with behaving according to these set gender roles and revolting against them by refusing to accept to follow the normative cycle set before her by her parents and the Doyles, and rather wanting to free herself of the hold of these roles and expectations. Uh, in the, it is in this process of liberation, both metaphorical and literal, that she must come to terms with these contrasting feelings she has of how she's expected to act and her true desires, and in turn, her fears. Quote, uh, Noemi, in high, uh, Noemi wondered if high place had robbed Catalina of her illusions or if they were meant to be shattered all, all along. Marriage could hardly be like the passionate romances one reads about in books. It seemed to her, in fact, a rotten deal. Men would be solicitous and well-behaved when they courted a woman, asking her out to parties and sending her flowers. But once they married, the flowers wilted. You didn't have married men posting love letters to their wives. That's why Noemi tended to cycle through admirers. She worried a man would be briefly impressed with her, with her luster, only to later lose in, only to lose interest later on. Easy, shallow men. Yet the thought of anyone more substantial made her nervous. She was trapped between competing desires, a desire for more meaningful connection and the desire for to never change. She wished for eternal youth and endless merriment. End quote. Noemi's journey to liberation is what creates a threshold between the ideological and the supernatural. While she aims not to live by the standards and expectations set before her, she also harvests the anxieties of being left out and, be and of being alone. Yet she pushes forward and rejects the expectations people have of her and instead sets about to unveil the anonymous truth of those residing in high place. In her search for answers about the Doyles in High Place, she learns of the dark forces at play that both reinforce and uh, reinforces and embodies the trauma of colonial tension and forced uh, gender roles. The gloom, which is pivotal to the story text and constantly present, uh, we find out is actually the spirit of Agnes Doyle, the first wife of Howard Doyle. Uh, it is the she's, all, she's the supernatural power at work in the house and also in the people inhabiting the house. Uh, Noemi realizes this in the following quote. And it struck her all of a sudden, this fact that she had missed, which should have been more obvious from the very beginning, that the frightening and twisted gloom that surrounded them was the manifestation of all the suffering that had been inflicted on this woman, Agnes driven to madness, driven to anger. And even now a sliver of that woman remained and that sliver was still screaming in agony. She was the snake biting its tail. She was a dreamer, eternally bound to a nightmare, eyes closed even when her eyes had turned to dust. The buzzing was her voice. She could not communicate properly any longer but could still scream of unspeakable horrors inflicted on her, of ruin, of pain. Even when her coherent memory and thought had been scraped away, the searing rage remained, burning the minds of any who wandered near it. What she did want, what did she want? Simply to be released of this torment, simply to wake up, but she couldn't, she couldn't ever wake up, end quote. It is this realization that Agnes as the, uh, Agnes as the gloom, uh, wait, it is this realization that Agnes as the gloom has been harvesting the trauma of both colonial ideology imposed by Howard Doyle and the, and the gender role set forth by this ideology that enlightens Noemi with the solution to freedom. She must set Agnes free of these ties in order to free herself and those that she set on rescuing. It is only then that they can truly leave high place and the colonial and sexist ideologies that are embodied within it. 
While we see Noemi manage to escape and rescue those she cares about, Moreno Garcia leaves us with the unsettling and very real lingering feeling that no matter what Noemi does, she will always be haunted by high place and all it stood for, and by extension that we, the reader, will also continue to be haunted by these notions. Thank you. Very good, thank you very much, Alejandra. <coughs> Our next speaker, and I think it's perhaps our last speaker is Christopher Acroll, who is a PhD candidate in English at the University of California, Riverside. He graduated from the University of Bergen in 2017 with an MA in English Literature on Masculinity and Intersex Identities in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Ian Banks, Banks the Wasp Factory. His current work looks at how social, psychological, philosophical, semiotics, and architecture can help understand Gothic place and space as inversion of the classic promises of shelters. Christopher. Thank you, George, for that introduction. Uh, can you all see my presentation? Yes. Great. Uh, like you can see, my internet is also not the best. It's been kind of in and out all day, but hopefully it'll, it'll get us uh, through this. So I am conducting an interrogation into the chase as a narrative device for exploring the relationship between place, space, and character. The key theoretical lens will be the theory of affordances, which is a concept initially developed in psychology to describe animal environment relations. My interrogation starts by looking at the central opening chase in Horace Walpole's The Castle of Otranto, before looking at another seminal chase to introduce later in John Carpenter's Halloween and Joseph Cena's Friday the 13th, the final chapter. My hope is to bridge these texts through an understanding of the archetypal Gothic as deeply rooted in a sense of place centered around exploration and panic. Now, the theory of affordances uh, was first developed by psychologist James Gibson in 1977 to map living creatures' realization of their environment. Affordances are any potential uses to lie embedded in the animal surrounding. The discovery of affordances is often automatic and lies inherent in the animal's capabilities of surveying surrounding geography. Gibson saw the relationship between animal and environment as complementary, meaning that they were on equal footing when creating the affordances involved. However, the relationship is not equal because the animal is dependent on its environment, whereas the environment is not dependent on the animal. The animal is then at the best of the possibilities that are at any moment present within the surrounding topography. Now, applications of this to human environments and the chase, we need to first look at Donald Norman's application of the theory of affordances to design objects and environments. This application to design allowed Norman to think about what may constitute good design, which to Norman is when the user can instantaneously ascertain how to utilize an object or space. However, sometimes designs may be counterintuitive to the expectations that the user has for the object or environment. A door with door handles will, for instance, be assumed the need to be pulled to open. But if the door needs to be pushed, there will be a moment of confusion. In such ways, poor design may negatively influence and disorient the very people it is meant to serve. Literary critic Caroline Levine has used affordances to think about form in literary studies in a continuation of Norman and Gibson's work. Levine broadens the terminology of form and affordances to also think about social arrangements, particularly hierarchies. To Levine, social spaces offer affordances in connection with the places they take place in. It is also possible to transplant the science to new environments, bringing affordances with them to the new space that they may form. Now, in my extrapolation of the term for this, my dissertation work, I argue that a design environment, such as architecture, adds a third, third partner to the equation the designer or architect, who has through their creative powers designed the environment with specific uses in mind. To reside in a designed building is then to be already under the influence of someone else's intentions as their creation dictates to some extent what is and is not possible within the place. In other cases, the subject may find affordances that were not initially thought of by the architect. Social spaces are in large part dependent on the possibilities of the places in which they practice. Individuals when confronted with a space or a place must then wrestle with what affordances may be gained from them. The interaction between subject, place, and architecture, architectural intention 
come together in a Foucauldian process of innate operations. Since architecture is at the outset a design place meant to facilitate specific spaces, the question ultimately becomes who is the design place for and who may utilize it to their own advantage. In comes the chase. Now the chase plays with this question as it puts two independent actors up against one another while embedded in a specific environment. The chase is central in Gothic fiction, where the pursuit of a person, most often a young woman, by a pursuer, most often another man, has been characterized by literary scholar Donna Highland as Gothic in its purest form. Previous work on the chase has been done by scholars such as Noel Carroll, who summarizes that chases become suspenseful just in case the outcomes of these events are such that two logically opposed conclusions are in the forefront of the spectator's attention. And moreover, moreover in such a way that the likely outcome is patently evil, while the moral outcome becomes, appears to be a long shot. As a narrative device, the chase thoroughly ties characters to the place within which they exist. I am focusing on chases that occur in limited interior spaces over a smaller time frame with usually one pursuer and one victim. This is to distinguish it from other uh, works of fiction, which might utilize chases over a longer period. The reasoning is that during this configuration, the tree or pursuer, victim, and environment are in their closest and most immediate relation to one another. The chase most often, during the chase, the villain is most often close behind the hero, sometimes measured in feet, and the hero must do their best to recontextualize the affordances the place may offer to the advantage of the villain. The chase is at its most dispensable when the immediate objective is clearly presented. If the hero is caught, they will either die or be forced into actions they do not want. The challenge is equally immediate. The hero needs to overcome the reshaping of the space done by the villain to their own benefit. The Gothic chase is in this way one of the purest forms of architectural exploration because it happens immediately through the chase. By this I mean that through the storytelling device, the affordances and limitations of the space are made clear to both protagonist and reader as the chase unfolds. So in the castle of Otranto, Isabella discovers Manfred's plot to marry her against her wishes to produce a male heir. The reveal of him as a powerful patriarch set upon containing his male line is not in and of itself surprising. What is, is that he is willing to utilize the potential of Otranto as highly defensible keep and prison to keep her there. Consequently, Isabella's flight through the castle recontextualizes it as a prison meant to keep her there. The gates are closed, the servants are looking for her. She is imprisoned by that which had previously kept her safe. However, she is able to find affordances there of her own as she, quote, recollected a subterraneous passage which led from the walls of the castle to the church of St. Nicholas. When she reached the altar before she was overtaken, she knew even Manfred's violence would not dare profane the sacredness of the place. Isabella is able to seek out a place wherein she can use cultural and religious affordances to overcome Manfred. In a more immediate present, she can recontextualize the foundations of the castle as being in her favor as well, since she can escape through the subterraneous caverns. The chase frames the castle of Otranto as Manfred's domain and provides him an identification between state and familial power, as he may use the potentials inherent in the castle to imprison Isabella for his nefarious plot. However, Isabella may also utilize the space into escaping as the castle is built upon a hollow foundation, thus showing that Manfred's rule and control of the space is by no means absolute, as he can provide affordances for her as well. Her flight likewise becomes a map of the castle as well as her mind. The reader comes to understand that the castle is centered around the central staircase, which Isabella is fleeing uh, down, and is built upon hollow ground. As Manfred's actions become increasingly transgressive through the novel, so does his castle begin to change and crumble around him. There is simply not room for the affordances that he seeks, and each of his fits in rage and desire brings his line closer to ruination. In the archetypical early Gothic texts, such as the Castle of Otranto or the Mistress of Rudolfo, the villain is able to weaponize the potential of the castle as a space which both provides affordances for protection, it is after all highly defensible, and as a prison. The young heroine must then seek to utilize the space in her favor. Now, from the castles of medieval Italy to the modern suburbs of the United States, the chase continues as a central part of the Gothic. Laurie Strode's flight from Michael Myers in Halloween, or the many final girls of the Friday the 13th series, occur through houses staged with the corpses of their friends. The houses are turned into a place of abject terror, and its form and meaning become intertwined with the Gothic subject's flight from the perceived threat. 
The traditional slasher villain this, uh, thus changes the landscape of the familiar by infusing it with their own rules and aesthetic. For instance, Michael Myers reconfigures the suburban home into an altar to the dead, to dead youth and femininity. The once stable home is shown to also provide the affordances Michael needs to execute his own sense of symbiosis. As he slowly takes over the Doyle house, the house becomes darker and he's shown to be able to work uninterrupted in a densely populated suburban area. <coughs> the suburbs, once thought as safe due to the careful watchfulness of nearby neighbors, are portrayed as indifferent to Michael's actions. The most crucial example of which is when Laurie tries to call a neighbor for help only to have the neighbor's lights be turned off in refusal of her pleas. Now, by the time Laurie enters the Doyle's house where Michael has been at work, the place has fundamentally changed in Michael's favor. Corners are pitch black and the camera is low on the ground looking up, obscuring the floor and easy orientation in the space for both Laurie and viewer alike. As she makes her way upstairs, her search throughout the house slowly reveals how much the shape uh, and Michael Myers has been able to change it into this semiotic world. In the upstairs parents' bedroom, Michael has fashioned an altar to his dead sister out of the body of Laurie's friend Annie. Michael's motives and wants remain a mystery throughout the first Halloween film, although later installments have done their best to explain it away. His intentions and wants for affordances are instead portrayed through how he changes the world around him. In, he is infusing the space with his own psychic of meaning, recontextualizing it. Michael's actions portray the suburbs as having a design that equally favors his murder of youth and it does its protection of families. The suburban home equally favors him as he finds the affordance to appear out of the darkness behind the glory, cementing that this is his domain as much as hers. However, later, while ultimately, ultimately hiding from and fighting back, Laurie, is, Laurie will use spaces and objects of domesticity in her struggle to, in the struggle to survive. A knitting needle, a closet, and a coat hanger are all recontextualized as the space as protective. A lingering question that happens through most of the slasher films of the late 70s and early 80s is whether or not the final girl, as, no, as uh, defined by uh, Carol Clover, can reclaim the space to her advantage by utilizing the affordances embedded within it against the pursuer? The answer is oftentimes yes, I see in films like Halloween or Nightmare on Elm Street, but it can also sometimes be a no, as happens in Friday the 13th, the final chapter, where a girl is pursued under similar circumstances to a final girl, but fails to utilize the space in her favor. Now, to set this up, the film sets up two potential final girls, uh, in two different houses on Crystal Lake, you have Sarah, Sarah played by Barbara Howard, and Trish Jarvis, Kim, played by Kimberly Beck. These are both presented with similar challenges, which they have been handled very differently. They both uh, embed qualities that are stereotypically associated with final girls. Sarah is the first one that is tested. She discovers a, a body and brutally murder in the shower. And she consequently flees down the stairs into the front door. She is unable to open the door, but stays there while trying to spring it open. The space, however, cannot grant her the affordances that she has come to expect that the door will open and she, she may escape. And she is struck, um, she is struck through the door by an axe, which embeds in her chest. Later, Trish is put through a similar scenario. She discovers the same body in the bathroom and runs downstairs to warn her companion Rob. Jason Boris comes out and kills Rob while Trish flees. Trish then tries to open the same door that Sarah is trying to open, but, in, 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 but there she finds a body. Uh, she tries for another door and another body is displayed there as well, blocking her escape. She does however not linger as Sarah did, but instead moves on to the next possible way of escape. She's finally able to smash her way through a window with Jason in pursuit. Trist thus emerges as the final girl of the film because she is able to reshape the space into her favor. She continues to be able to weaponize the space against Jason by throwing various forms of decor at or over him throughout the chase. In conclusion, the chase will initially reveal how the villain has shaped the space in his favor. However, as the chase progresses, the heroine will be able to find affordances within the design of the place which she can recontextualize to save herself. 
in a larger application, the chase betrays the innate expectations for people that buildings will, uh, to some degree, afford and accommodate them. Yet there is a sizable number for whom this is not the case. The pursuit in these sequences experience the promise of the building to afford them indefinitely from the pursuer. Yet they may both discover possibilities unthought of embedded within the architectural design. The sense of secrecy and entrapment of the chase may make how different people feel and navigate such spaces outside of fiction. When building fails to conform to the expectation placed on them, it is a disruption of the habitual affordances to people form the interaction with their dwellings. A building's affordances are granted depending on who they were built for and who is trying to use them now. Now the Gothic chase both reveals and blurs this process. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have plenty of time for questions. Would anyone like to ask any of our speakers a question or would the speakers like to ask you, each other any questions? I actually have a question for Alejandra. Um, I loved both of your presentations a lot. Um, I, I've read Mexican Gothic. I think it's a wonderful novel. I actually taught it in my summer course um, this past summer. So I was wondering um, the ending of the book, I find it a bit problematic. Um, so I just wanted to hear your thoughts because Noemi, sorry, spoiler alert for people who haven't read it. Um, Noemi um, ends up with Francis and Francis of course is a descendant and part of the Doyle family. So I wanted to hear your thoughts and why do you think Marina Garcia chose this ending of Noemi kind of fulfilling a gender role of um, you know having like a happy ending with um, you know this of course, Francis is good, but he's still connected to um, the Doyle family. I just wanna hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, so I purposely left out like the love interest and the weird love triangle that happens in the novel because it's so complicated. <laughs> uh, but I guess like a very clear cut answer to that is yes, he's part of the Doyle, but he rejects and is kind of queered in a way where like, he doesn't fall into the normative male role or the normative male character that is expected for her to be with, right? And throughout the novel, even she comes to that realization of like, this guy is not the kind of guy that I should go for that I would even normally think to look at. And yet there's something about him that calls her to, like calls her to him and that also makes her feel safe. And I think it's that notion of like the querying and the safety that she feels that makes that relationship significant, but it still has its complications implications, right? There's still its implications of him being related to this long line of like horrendous colonial uh, settlers and what that means for her as a Mexican woman. Uh, and I think that that's why, uh, or at least I, I like to speculate that that's why Moreno Garcia like left in that that like opportunity to continue to see that relationship grow. Because uh, who knows, like maybe in the epilogue or in the second part of the of a novel of the novel we see the way that the relationship is affected by these you know um complications and see how that kind of carries forward but it is it's a complicated relationship and it and it stirs up complicated feelings but um i think at the end it's that's why because he's he's so different and in this very weird sense uh very queer version of what is the the gothic male figure Thank you. Yeah, that that helps me like rethink and kind of reprocess um, that. Uh, Lindsay, I wanted to ask you about uh, female villains that aren't vampires, um, uh, and if they fall into the same category like Victoria in uh, Dacre's novels of Floya, or other other women that are transgressive but aren't quite vampires. Do you think they're vampiric? I mean, do they do similar things to what the vampires do? Yeah, absolutely. I actually have never read um, Zofloya, so I need to add that to my list. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, they're not, the female vampire isn't the only, you know, monstrous um, uh, female character in the Gothic, of course, that subverts um, patriarchal authority and power. Um, but I just wanted to kind of, hone in and focus on the female um, vampire just for purposes of this um, 
of this conference paper, but yeah, there are definitely femme fatales and other monstrous um, female figures that definitely would fall, I, I would argue, under the female um, Gothic tradition. I actually have a question to piggyback off of that uh, for you, Lindsay. Um, I'm wondering, because when I was sort of doing the research for this, I, I came across what I'm guessing is a relatively new term of like the post-feminist feminist, uh, Gothic literature and uh, how they kind of complicate the way that we see like the melodramatic or, or the female character in Gothic literature and was wondering if you came across that too and how that kind of shifts the way that we view women in Gothic literature, whether they be the villain or the hero. Yeah, I'm not too, I've only researched a little bit of post-feminist um, Gothic. Um, and of course, I, as I addressed in my paper too, the, the term female Gothic is a bit problematic too, just because, um, you know, there have been developments in gender theory of, you know, gender is a construct. Um, so is it essentialist to, you know, just call it women, only women authors can be included in this tradition. So I'm still working through, um, that research and kind of rethinking of, you know, uh, do I stay with this category of, of woman, of what is female? Um, and so that's why I've kind of wanted to branch it out to include male authors, so not just uh, women authors, but going back to your point of uh, post-feminist Gothic, um, yeah, I, I think I need to research more into that and see how it would definitely um, kind of problematize um, perhaps my argument and my research, um, but thank you for bringing that up. Catherine, do you have a question? Yes, let me see if. There you are. <laughs> Hi. Thank you all for a really wonderful panel. Um, and it, um, Alejandra, I'm kind of jumping off of something you said. It's it's very much an aside, but when you were talking about spelling the gloom, and I was wondering about the way in which the persistence of the Gothic has to do with us not wanting to dispel the gloom, right? The, and you know, I was thinking all these, I don't know how many of these you've watched, I've only watched some, but like Penny Dreadful did this kind of Marvel universe of Gothic characters. There was, you know, Mina from Dracula and Dorian Gray and all of these sort of bound together to solve the problems of the empire or whatever. Um, and, you know, the final girl, um, um, you know, that, that's an idea that actually went from scholarship back into the movies, right? In Scream, they're all talking about the final girl. So there seems to be something about this kind of relationship between the criticism of the Gothic and the elaboration of it in contemporary culture. Um, and is this, I, I just would love to know what you think um, about this, if that made sense. <laughs> yeah. Um... I think it does. Um, and I think it it kind of comes back to that lingering feeling that we find in the novel of like the, the residual haunting. Um, and I actually feel that like what Christoph was talking about of sort of like changing the way that the domestic home space is viewed in, in these films. And I think by extension in the genre that is Gothic literature is kind of what like is pushing us towards a more contemporary um, analysis of the way that we're sort of viewing like the residual effects of what happens after the gothic story has ended uh like for this novel at the end spoiler alert if you haven't read it um the house gets burnt down and the fog is no more the gloom is no more however like there's this notion that there's always going to be a little something left and whether that be like a physical residual or whether that be like an emotional trauma that the characters carry with them uh which they actually say out loud then it, it's still there it's still present and I think that that's where like yes we're dispelling we're dispelling like the quite literal sense of what is the haunting of what is you know the the gothic tropes however like the emotional lingering is still there and that's sort of where we we are moving more into like you know and I think this can be applied both to film and media and also literature like we still carry these things with us so they are still very much part of our of our analysis and and moving forward are the way that we start to perceive these spaces. I hope that answers that question. <laughs> Christopher, you might have something to say about that too. Uh, yeah, uh, 
I, I do find that sort of like interwovenness of sort of literary criticism and sort of like scholarly work with pop culture to be to be very fascinating because as you said like the final girl like that wasn't really a thing until that really started appearing. I think that goes for slashers really in general. Like in the beginning, they weren't really what they became like uh, stereotypically. They're, they're much more experimental and sort of like freeform in the way they approach it. And after a while, it really gets cemented as a specific genre. And so there's sort of like the residual of the Gothic in general. Joseph Crawford has a great book where he talks about the biggest legacy of the early Gothic texts is really that it allowed this language of terrorism to sort of like seep into the political discourse and it sort of like talks around like how it Im imbued just all these different discourses with the language of good and evil so for instance he really, really looks at discussions around like the Sepoy rebellion in India in the middle of the 19th century and how that was being portrayed so like back, back in the British Isles and it really was this language of like almost these like vampires sort of coming in and sort of like massacring British citizens, but also ignoring the atrocities committed by, by British troops, naturally. And, and he really traces that throughout the 19th century as that maybe being the biggest influence the Gothic has had so like on culture is that it really brought back this almost medieval idea of evil as something that is sort of like lingering out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of my students um, who finished her PhD a few years ago, Laura Westengard, talks about how Gothic tropes are used in trauma theory and so on as a way of explaining psychology um, and because they're inescapable. Once you, once you introduce Gothic tropes, it's, it's an easy way to explain uh, psychological states or even social uprisings. And, and you know, it's, it's amazing how supple Gothic, Gothic uh, effects and Gothic techniques Right, light and dark, or uh, uh, something spooky and mysterious, and and so on. And you, I think you're you're finding your way into all sorts of uh, 20th century, 21st century uh, ways of thinking about anything. Or if you think about any popular, I'm going out of my depth here, but I'll just say popular TV shows or series. Think about the kinds of gothic effects that are used everywhere. I mean, even I mean certainly in True Blood and, 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 and the, the, those vampire films, of course, but even in social stories, in things like Riverdale, there's so many Gothic effects, you're kind of uh, surprised that it's not called a Gothic story. So, I mean, it's, it's worth thinking about that when you're doing this research into Gothic, how, how uh, infinitely available it is for de describing any kinds of psychological or any kinds of horror. Um, I wanted to ask Christopher also just about castles and it's one thing to have a haunted ha a house becomes haunted in a certain way but then there are in in the gothic tradition it really starts in castles and what is it about a castle that makes it, it you did a good job of saying explaining how a Toronto works what would you say about Udolpho or some of the other 19th century castles that are by definition, Gothic castles. I think, uh, as I sort of like mentioned, castles have this almost automatic dual purpose where they are both protective to people from the outside, but also designed to keep people in. You know, they, they have this very almost uh, sort of like intermediary position within and like the hierarchy where they are like symbols of power, they are symbols of so like, you know, uh, in large parts of like patriarchy and that they're embedded into like feudal structures. There's all like this very, talking about, you know, so like malleable qualities of, of Gothic, they are this very little like malleable uh, symbol that can be used for so many different things. Uh, you know, least of all, I think, going into like late 18th late, late century when so like Atranto and Sudolfo are being written, you know, they, uh, there's been, of course, a lot of work done on so like how early Gothic might be shaped by this like fear of feudalism returning by so like British, <laughs> British English classes. So the fact that there's all like happening in these sort of like more more ancient feudal locations, like not just castles, abbeys, uh, so like often often appear, I think aren't necessarily um, uh, a coincidence at all. 
but but they're also sort of like about this potential that within these 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 sort of like central community power structures they can so easily be subverted for their own gains. So you know Manfred and 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 uh, Tony, that's his name, and Adolfo, <laughs> they're both sort of like able to to utilize this potential in the castle to really just like for their own designs to, to attain more power. And same in you know Matthew used the monk with Ambrosio, he's able to use the, the abbey. A central position within so like his community for the same 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 purpose. Sure. Good. 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 Any other questions or comments or requests? I just make one quick comment. Um, and Lindsay, I just wanted to tell you that you gave me this like total flashback of a good flashback of um, with your sort of gene the genealogy of feminist criticism. Like I remember literally sitting in the reserve books reading all those books my first year of graduate school um but i won't even ask i would just encourage you to think about nina auerbach in that that genealogy because the the angel and the demon kind of goes at this very differently i think i think part of it is that auerbach never really wanted to pick a side <laughs> you know um and then she wrote this amazing kind of um pseudo memoir called our vampires ourselves i don't know if you've ever read that it's about hammer films but her kind of intellectual biography and and these strange british horror movies but um but she was very much of that generation a very original thinker i mean george certainly knew her too so yes yes i agree whole yeah. uh what 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 lindsay made me think of were at that moment when all those Gothic novels appeared because they were written by women and we hadn't heard them before, suddenly there were the novels by Dacre and other people that had never, I'd never heard of them until suddenly we're finding novels by women and they were Gothic novels. And it's, you know, it's, it, it really was an amazing moment. Uh, and of course they've now, they're now part of the canon and that's great. And that, but that was, that was, uh, the 70s and 80s, when those things started appearing, it changed, it really changed the field. I would just throw in that's true in um, certainly in American literature, but in African American literature too. Some of the great finds were things like Of One Blood, the, these kind of serial novels. There was this big, um, I mean, there, there is a real history of the black american gothic to be written that you know goes all the way to get out and them i think yeah yeah my um next, my next book sorry my next focus right. would be to like in um you know move into more contemporary times of looking at fledgling um by octavia butler um why it is for witching which i know is like mostly it's not a vampire um fiction but just kind of moving more into um exploring like black gothic and uh, women of color gothic as well for my research that was a great project that sounds great um anything else before we go i want to thank you all for a wonderful panel i'm so pleased uh, I think everything came together beautifully and you did, all did a wonderful job and now we're recorded for, for posterity. So, um, and I hope I'll see you next year. The, um, Pamela is going to be at UCLA and uh, I'm going to chair another Gothic panel. So, um, and then I'll pass the torch to someone else who wants to chair a Gothic panel. But thank you all and thank you, Catherine and everyone else who attended. It's been wonderful and uh, Good luck in your work. You have great projects and maybe I'll see at least Alejandra and Christopher on campus. Goodbye, thank you very much. I loved your presentations. It was nice meeting everyone. Hi, <laughs> meeting everyone. Great Thanks, bye, bye. everyone. Bye.